Blessed is he who comes in the name of Jesus. My prayer is that you will be drawn into an ever-deepening relationship with the God of creation. Jesus changed my life. He's still changing lives. Anything less than truth will be unsatisfying, and in the end, it will be revealed for what it is, error. Now, please don't be confused. Jewish observances will not purchase your salvation. It can only come through the finished work of the cross. Shalom, y'all. That's the way a Jew in Texas says howdy. Now, I'm no cowboy, but I am a Jew in Texas, and I'm glad you joined me here for another visit at Crosstalk. Today's program is called, Who is Israel's Messiah? Listen, I'll give you a hint. It's not an American politician or a modern Israeli statesman. The answer is life-changing, and it won't be determined by a popular election. Nevertheless, Israel needs a Messiah, and I know where to find him. The Hebrew Scriptures point to a deliverer, yet the Jewish world wrestles with his identity. Let me describe the Messiah in the words of a respected Hebrew prophet from the Jewish Bible. I'll use the Jewish Publication Society's version of the Masoretic text. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of pains and acquainted with disease, and as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely our diseases he did bear and our pains he carried, whereas we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep did go astray. We turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath made to light on him the iniquity of us all. I was reading from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 to 6. Now, some Jewish scholars refer to him as Moshiach ben Yosef, or the Messiah, son of Joseph. He is better known as the famous suffering servant. This text is clearly a messianic prophecy from the Jewish scriptures. But who is this suffering servant? Who is this chastised, stricken savior of the Jewish Bible? Isaiah clearly declares that it was he who bore our griefs. He carried our sins. I remember hearing a Jewish friend of mine explain that the word used by Isaiah was the same word used by Moses related to the scapegoat, Azazel. This was the scapegoat that carried our sins into the wilderness, or as Moses described it, he bore them. The same word is used, and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities, as explained in Leviticus. Now, I must tell you that I am a Jewish believer in a Jewish Savior. And after tedious research, the most logical conclusion is still the obvious one. As a Jewish grad student in a respected Jewish school of rabbinic higher education, I carefully considered the issues from both sides. I have read the scriptures in Hebrew. I've studied them in English. I've carefully reviewed the rabbinic arguments against the logical selection of Jesus as Messiah. I have studied the Jewish anti-missionary positions, and there are many. Nevertheless, I am solidly convinced that there is no mystery as to the identity of Isaiah's messianic suffering servant. A humble Jewish maiden named Miriam, I guess you might call her Mary, gave birth to a perfect child named Yeshua. The church calls him Jesus, the son of of the God of Israel. Coincidentally, his adoptive father, Yosef, or Joseph, was Jewish. Moshiach ben Yosef. That has a familiar ring, doesn't it? Joseph was Jewish. His uncle, Zechariah, was a Jewish priest. He had a famous cousin named Yochanan. The boy, an older cousin to Jesus, was better known as John the Baptist. But I promise you that John the Baptist was not a Baptist. Well, what would you expect? 
Would you join up with a ragtag group led by Yochanan the Mikvah man? I didn't think so. The truth is that all of the friends and followers of Jesus were Jewish. We call them the disciples, but he would have called them his Talmidim. They were his students. He was their teacher. That is why he was called rabbi. Jesus followed the Jewish paradigm and his rabbinic style of teaching. And his reference sources came from the Jewish literature. Remember, friend, the New Testament church didn't have a New Testament. They didn't read the National Enquirer. So what did they read? Inquiring minds want to know, and I will tell you. They read the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. They studied the Jewish apocryphal writings and the Jewish pseudepigraphical literature. If you followed this program, Crosstalk, you probably already know this stuff. But if this stuff surprises you, it simply means that you're somewhat unfamiliar with the Jewish origins of the Christian faith. Of course, I hope to remedy this lack. Jews and non-Jews should understand that the early church was thoroughly Jewish. There were simply no non-Jews in the club when Christianity emerged in early first century Judea. That is why it is not intellectually honest for Jewish people to believe that you can't be Jewish and believe in Jesus. History proves otherwise. Jewish Christianity was the norm in antiquity, and it is equally errant for non-Jewish Christians to ignore their own Jewish heritage. To deny the Jewishness of the gospel is to ignore the literature itself. The story of the life of Jesus is a thoroughly Jewish story. If you really want to believe it, you don't have to be Jewish. But uh, a Jewish understanding of the issues is really quite beneficial. I mean, think about it. The New Testament account took place in a Jewish land among Jewish people in Jewish synagogues dealing with Jewish laws, Jewish customs, and Jewish literature. The story of his life was written by Jewish men called apostles. The Bible consists of 66 books. 64 of them were written by Jews, predominantly two Jews, four Jews. Oh, I'll give you, there was one Gentile in the list of authors. Okay, he wasn't Jewish, but he was a doctor. His name was Luke, and he wrote two of the 66 books of the Bible to tell the Jewish story of a Jewish Savior to a non-Jewish world so that the light of Israel could become the light of the nations. As a result of his work and the work of his Jewish peers, the Jewish believers of the first century began the process of revealing the God of Israel to the Gentile world. And as the conditions of our culture continue deteriorating into moral lawlessness, it's happening. I want to announce the love of God and the coming of our Messiah, a hopeless world needs hope. A discouraged population needs encouragement, and that is why this outreach exists. In a moment, we will further analyze the suffering servant described by the Hebrew prophet Isaiah. And I'd love to give you a free transcript or video download of this program. Stay tuned for details. Shalom, Chaverim. Hello, my friends. May I ask you to consider a powerful messianic prophecy? Do you realize that the message of the Messiah of Israel has successfully been declared around most of the world? The God of Israel, revealed in the Jewish Bible, has been made known to Gentiles across the globe. This is a remarkable reality to consider. In fact, it's a miracle. People who hate the Jews love our God. And people who have never met a Jew worship the God of the Jewish scriptures. Our God has become their God, and it is all because of a Jewish man born 2,000 years ago in ancient Israel. Christianity is the vehicle that our God employed to reveal himself to the Gentiles. And as a result, the Gentiles in enormous numbers now know the God of Israel. But you see, this was one of the most important fulfillments of Messianic prophecy. The Hebrew prophets foretold this aspect of our promised Messiah. The Bible proclaims that our Messiah would be a light to the nations. Literally in Hebrew, the Goyim, the Gentiles. God was extremely clear in his purpose. 
through the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, we learn about God's promised Messiah. He called him a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. No one can honestly disagree with this messianic fulfillment. Jesus has unquestionably completed this important element of Jewish prophecy. Jesus is obviously the Moshiach Hagoyim, the Messiah of the Gentiles. As Isaiah declared, the light of God's love has reached the Goyim, the nations, the Gentiles, know our God. Through Christ, the light has come, exactly as the Hebrew prophet declared. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light. This is what has happened, my friends. It's undeniable, it's unmistakable, it's a stark reality that as a result of Christianity, the God of Israel has been made known beyond Judaism and the boundaries of Israel. Because of Jesus, the God of Israel is finally known as the creator of the world. The Bible is true and it proclaims our Savior to all men and women of all races and national origins. My Messiah was promised in the pages of the Hebrew Bible. Even the Talmud admits that the Messiah is the primary subject of the Jewish scriptures. The ancient rabbinic text declares the world was created only for the Messiah. He is the focus of the Hebrew prophets. According to the most sacred rabbinic literature, the rabbis wrote, all the prophets prophesied only for the days of the Messiah. The Jewish scriptures declare our Messiah. Jews and Christians uniformly agree on this point. The disagreement is over his identity. So again, I must ask the question, who is the suffering servant prophesied by Isaiah? It is widely held that the suffering servant text is clearly messianic in nature. Jewish rabbis for many centuries before and after Jesus correctly identified the text of Isaiah as a messianic prophecy. And it was not uncommon for the 53rd chapter of Isaiah to be inextricably linked to the Jewish messianic hope. Now, I'm not suggesting that all ancient Jews who read the text found fulfillment in Jesus. Many did, others did not. In fact, many thousands did during the first century. I'm simply informing you that it was not a Christian theologian who decided that the text of Isaiah described the Jewish Messiah. Don't be deceived. Don't be confused. This was an ancient rabbinic interpretation of the text long before Jesus, and it remains messianic in nature for many today. This is true in spite of the fact that some modern rabbis don't like to admit this historical reality, and some may be unaware of it. They may be unfamiliar. Now, earlier, I read the text from the Jewish Bible translation. Permit me to recite it to you from the more familiar King James Version so you can see the similarities and also have a comparison for your review. It's virtually identical, perhaps a little more rhythmic. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The suffering servant text from Isaiah reveals the Messiah, Yeshua, or Jesus as he is known, is the only plausible candidate. Yet many rabbis reject the interpretation that Isaiah was predicting Jesus. Who then do they say the prophet was writing about? Stay tuned, I'm going to tell you. The Bible speaks for itself. It is far more convincing than any other argument I could put forth. For that reason, I will read it one more time from the Jewish Publication Society's version of the Masoretic text. I'm doing so because this important messianic section of the Jewish Bible is generally not read by Jews in the synagogue. Actually, 
I had forgotten about this fact until I was doing my research for this edition of the program. I went back to my old Sonsino edition of the Hebrew and English versions that I studied from many, many years ago when I was a young man training for my bar mitzvah. Shockingly, I could not find the text. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah was intentionally not included in this book. Now, this is fascinating. It's as though this profound and powerful prophecy has been hidden from my people. Literally, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is not included in the weekly Haftorah readings. Now, of course, it is in our Hebrew Bible but it is not read during the service with the other Bible readings. For that reason, most of my people are simply unfamiliar with these words. Therefore, I am compelled to read them one more time. You must hear this. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of pains and acquainted with disease and is one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely our diseases he did bear and our pains he carried. Whereas we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep did go astray. We turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath made to light on him the iniquity of us all. As you can see, the words come directly from the Holy Scriptures. This is the Jewish Publication Society version of the Bible, and they are predictive of the Jewish Messiah who would atone for our sins. But who was Isaiah describing? To countless millions of people, this ancient Hebrew text is one more unavoidable proof that Jesus is the promised Messiah. He is the one who brought our redemption in his death. The first time I read those words, I was apprehended by their clarity. This is a picture of Jesus. His image is so clearly detailed in this prophecy. If not Jesus, who? There are other alternatives suggested by rabbis who reject Jesus as Messiah. One rabbinic interpretation typically used is to suggest that Israel itself is the subject of Isaiah's description. They attempt to explain that the nation of Israel must be God's suffering servant. They suggest that this is proven by the fact that the Jews have been despised, rejected, and they have suffered horrible humiliation in every generation. However, this is obviously an impossible substitution. Though Israel can lay claim to being hated and rejected, this was only one required characteristic of the suffering servant identified by Isaiah. According to the prophecy, the Messiah suffered without complaining. He did not open his mouth in defense of his innocence. He went like the proverbial lamb to the slaughter. The same cannot be said about Israel. Some of us have turned complaining into an art form. But complaining is not the only disqualifying factor. Israel could not have been the suffering servant described under any circumstance because God chose to make his soul an offering for sin. The specific type of sacrifice detailed is the asham, also known as the guilt offering. This particular sacrifice needed to be perfect, without spot or blemish. Israel was imperfect, spotted, sin-scarred, and unmistakably blemished. Israel would have been an impure offering. This becomes the unyielding problem that disqualifies the Jewish people from filling the shoes of the suffering servant. We were unclean. We were impure. We were sinners. And in fact, we were judged and exiled for our behavior. The same prophet declared our sin-stained condition by saying, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord. 
We were not holy. We were unrighteous. As such, we could not be God's righteous servant. Every honest reader, Jewish or Gentile, must admit that it is clearly an unworkable contrivance by creative interpreters. It fails every test of a clear reading of the Bible. Even the great medieval Jewish philosopher Maimonides is alleged to have rejected the notion of Israel as a potential candidate for Israel's suffering servant. Clearly, the prophet foretold a coming righteous servant who could and would suffer on our behalf, one who would carry our guilt. Again, I must ask, if not Jesus, then who? Who's the other contestant that Jews nominate to fill the position of our suffering servant? I'll tell you in just a moment. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to the final segment of this edition of Crosstalk. I'm Randy Weiss, and I want to discuss the most troubling issue in Jewish scripture. Who was the suffering servant of the prophecy of Isaiah? Since Jewish rabbis tend to reject the Christian claim that Jesus was the subject of the prophecy, one must ask, to whom then did the prophet refer? Clearly, as detailed in our previous segment, the nation of Israel fails as a possible candidate. Another figure often suggested by the rabbis is that of good king Hezekiah. They look to the historical context of the time of the prophecy. Some rabbis, therefore, identify King Hezekiah as a potential messianic figure sent by God to deliver the Jewish people from political oppression, a royal deliverer sent by God. But once again, this interpretation is seriously flawed. Isaiah's messianic prophecy depicts the subject as God's righteous servant. Hezekiah was a man, a decent man, but still subject to man's sinful nature, rendering him less than perfect. He was therefore unable to be the asham. He was impure so as to disqualify him from being the guilt offering. One Jewish apologist suggested that King Hezekiah was the mystery man pictured by Isaiah because he is called the everlasting father. Now this fits nicely with one of the biblical titles given for the God-man. However, this everlasting father moniker is associated with Hezekiah due to the fact that God added 15 years to the end of Hezekiah's life. The episode is recounted in the 38th chapter of Isaiah. However, what the rabbis tend to leave off of Hezekiah's resume was that during that bonus 15-year term, Hezekiah fathered a son named Manasseh, the successor to his throne. Instead of the long-term salvation of Israel, what Hezekiah brought to Israel was the worst, most evil king ever foisted on the Jewish people. His son Manasseh is described as an abomination who was more wicked than the Amorites. Instead of true deliverance, Hezekiah's son caused Israel to become engaged in idolatry, abominable child sacrifice, and the worship of false gods. These specific sins brought calamity and judgment on my people. And God judged us and punished the nation worse than at any other time in our history. So, where does that leave us? If Israel is not the suffering servant of Isaiah's prophecy, and if Hezekiah did not fit the bill as our Messiah, then who was Israel describing? This question grabbed my soul when I read the words of the Bible as a young Jewish man, unfamiliar with the texts of Isaiah. Please, let me read the prophecy to you again in more of its entirety, and you decide for yourself who the author is describing. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Please, now is the time to decide for yourselves. Don't rest content in the opinion of others. Read the literature for yourselves. Now you've been confronted with the truth. What will you do with it? You are accountable. God offers a precious gift of life. He sent his Messiah to carry your sins. No other alternative exists to resolve the sin problem in your life. And sin is a problem. Like it or not, the Bible declares that you are a sinner, just as I am. In fact, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's a consequence to sin. The wages of sin is death. But God provided a solution to the devastating problem. It's a free gift, but it is only found in my Jewish Messiah. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm not going to ask you to lay your hand on the TV. I'm not going to send you an anointed prayer cloth. I don't want your money. <laughs> I don't want to argue about religion. I will conclude with a very simple statement of fact. I was a young married man of 20 years old. I was raised in a wonderful, wonderful Jewish home. I grew up with the knowledge of God. Nevertheless, I was in deep sin. I was guilty. Jesus changed my life. He's still changing lives. I'm just going to ask you to talk to God on your own. Don't take my word for this stuff. Ask God if I've told you the truth. In your own private moment, pray. God is real, and I believe he will reveal himself. He'll show you what's true and what's not. And then, if you would like us to pray with you or you need some more information, please contact me. You can reach me through my website at www.crosstalk.org or call 1-800-688-3422. If you like, please send a letter to me at Crosstalk. P.O. Box 2528, Cedar Hill, Texas, 75106, USA. I want to thank you for joining me here at Crosstalk. By the way, if you have ever wondered about how Judaism deals with sin and atonement, I've written a little book explaining the Jewish understanding of forgiveness. It's called In Search of the Lost Jewish Atonement. Actually, it discusses the history and traditions surrounding the Jewish festivals of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I'd be happy to send this to you if you feel it would help. I want you to understand these important issues. Call me, 1-800-688-3422. I'd really love to hear from you. Till next time, shalom and God bless you.